Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, or maybe already good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Taha Yasser from the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, my talk in terms of intellectual content and uh, importance is just the opposite of what we just <laughs> listened to. So I, I decided to pick up a side project, which is not that serious at all. But I'm very happy to be here and have the chance to, to introduce myself to you guys and to get to know you. Uh, I, I am trained in physics. My PhD is in complex system physics. Uh, I started to study social systems in my postdoc in Technical University in Hungary, and then I moved to Oxford about four years ago, joining the Oxford Internet Institute, which has the aim to study social aspects of the internet. And of course, we are a venture partner of the Turing Institute. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, mobile dating today. And at this time of, at this point of my talk, I usually ask the audience who is single by raising your hand. But a friend of mine told me it's a very personal question, you shouldn't ask that. <laughs> so I'm going to ask instead who, who is happy to let the other people in the room know that they are single. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I'm the only single person in the room, that's fine. The next question would have been, raise your hand if you're single and you're using any mobile dating app. Well, I'm not going to ask that question. You are a very serious, <laughs> shy audience. Uh, and even the last question would be, who is not single is still using mobile dating apps. That, that's not an option at all. Anyway, uh, you must know, even if you are all not using dating apps, you must have heard of uh, very new mobile dating technologies that are around now. Uh, for example, like Tinder. Ha has anyone ever heard of Tinder? From your friends, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Tinder is a mobile dating app, which is which is a very very uh, probably the largest one at the moment. It matches twenty six million uh, pairs per day worldwide, uh, and it, uh, it's, it's still growing. Uh, it, it's based on a very simple idea. You get to you set up a profile, you put on some pictures, you get to see other people's picture. If you like them, you swipe right. If you don't like them, you swipe left. If both of you uh, swipe each other's right, then you get a match and then you can initiate a conversation. So it's a very low cost sort of dating. But some people have made it even easier by inventing this thing called tender. It's a piece of meat uh, attached to an electric grinder which rotates and slaps the phone. So it swipes your phone for you and you don't need even to sit here. So you can let it swipe and then come back and see what it has found for you. Uh, well, some people have criticized, of course, uh, these technologies because it has made romance superficial. Well, I have no comments on that, but what we wanted to study was uh, patterns of communication. As I said, this is what you get uh, in, your, in your screen, and then if you both swipe right, you get matched, and then you can uh, have a dyadic uh, text-based conversation. Uh, and this is not new. We all have been using text messaging since years, or before that even emailing or texting, and uh, we are not the first people who have studied uh, communicate, text based communications. Uh, this is a very interesting paper that I really like to talk about. Uh, this is based on phone uh, communications and text communications in a European country. Uh, it's data from six months of six million people, uh, the largest operator of that country. Uh, they just simply counter two has been uh, talking to whom the most and define that person as the best friend. They also knew the age and gender of those best friends and also the ego. Uh, and then they could look, for example, at the gender of the best friend for male and female egos as a function of ego's age. Uh, the, the blue curve shows the data for men and the more negative the value here is that the more likely that the best friend is female. So starting from age of 18, the older men gets, it's more likely that their best friend, the person they communicate the most, is a woman. And of course it's mirrored for, for women egos, the best friend is a man. But up to a certain age, around 50, female users start to call another female more and more, and the best friend become their either daughter or they, I don't know, uh, female friends. So they're not that much interested in partner probably anymore at the age of 50. If you look at the second best friend, the pattern is different. For male, the best, second best friend is a male, probably their body, uh, up to age of 
34 so you better start to pick up a second best friend <laughs> who is more likely to be female well i'm not making a comment about that if you look at uh, female users uh, the second best friend is from the opposite sex at the age of 35 it switches back to to sorry it's from the same uh, uh, gender and then it switches back to uh, the opposite gender. Well, uh, the point here is that we can learn uh, about about uh, intimate relationships, about personal relationship, by just looking at very high level metadata of communication. Here, no content is analyzed at all. This is another paper which uh, is quite interesting as well. Uh, it looks at the duration of communications uh, on phone based on gender and time of the day, morning, afternoon, evening, night, and uh, different curves show different diets between males and females. For example, this the red curve up here shows uh, communications that are initiated by a female to a male. And you see that when you get to late night, the duration escalates to about 600 minutes on average. So those are all those late night calls that are initiated by a female uh, targeting at a male. Uh, again, we don't know about the content, but those of you who are not single probably have ideas what is what are those kind of calls about. So our project, well, this project that I'm going to present is mostly done by Jenny, my former MSc student who works at Uber now as a data scientist. Uh, well, not as a driver because clearly she has some drinking problems, as you can see <laughs> in the picture. Uh, but uh, Jenny was great, and uh, she had this idea that we want to study mobile dating, so we needed data because, well, we are quantitative people. Uh, we had different ideas how to collect data, like field study, going on dates, uh, meeting people, which would have led to something like this picture. So instead, we tried to contact companies, and these companies are extremely sensitive to uh, against any data sharing, as you can imagine, and I think this is something that we have to be uh, quite cautious at the Turing Institute as well that uh, how we can come up with nice protocols or NDAs that allows us to uh, allow us to, to share data or to get data from companies. It took us almost six months to do the, all the legal spec steps that both the university and the company wanted us to go through. Anyway, we got the data which contains uh, metadata of communications between 400,000 heterosexual users. Uh, this, these users are located in the U.S. in 30 different large cities. Uh, the mean age is 29, uh, median age is 27, majority of them have a degree. Uh, the data contains about 2 million conversations, and all the messages in all the 2 million conversations uh, build up 18 million messages, so it, it is big data. Uh, the duration of like the data set covers messages from November 2013 to April 2015. We did not have the content, it's very important, and I am not allowed to tell you what company and what app um, we have had this deal with, but what we had was the metadata of the conversations. For example, the timing, the length of the message, the gender of the initiator, uh, we did not have anything about their personality. We did not have their age or their location. Uh, basically, all we had was this. Well, we had a few more things. For example, if there was a question mark in a message uh, or exclamation mark, if there was a phone number in a message, uh, and those came very useful later with the, when we did the analysis. Well, let me start by showing some examples. These are not real examples. I've taken these pictures from an Instagram account called Tinder Nightmare which collects funny conversations coming from Tinder uh, because we did not have the content, but they show very interesting patterns that we also saw in our data set. Well, uh, someone got matched to another person and sent the message, you're actually perfect on uh, 27th of May, no response on 28th. The same person says, well, like, to be honest, even the way you ignored my message is perfect. So this is very common that you send a message to someone, you never get a response. Um, I have another example here. Uh, Jan January 19th, hey. January 23rd, hi. January 26th, hi. Four days later, hey. February 3rd, hi. And finally on February 3rd, the other person says persistence is key. And then the first person responses hi again. Not very creative, but what you see here is quite typical. 39% uh, of all the conversations only have 
one message in them. Someone said, hi, I never got any response, of course. And 51% of conversations are one directional. The person might have sent many messages, never got any response. And this is very important to know because if you are a user, you might start to think there is something wrong with you and no one responses to me. But this is very ubiquitous that people do not necessarily respond to you, even though they have already liked you. Well, they were not that serious. In, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> well, uh, we looked into the initiation time. How, how long does it take to people to send the first message after they got matched? Uh, this is the distribution. Well, this is the logarithm of the time in minutes. So three here means about 1,000 minutes. Uh, you see, the, it, it's a bimodal distribution. We have lots of conversation, which has started right after the match, uh, minute zero. And then the rest of conversation shows something like a log normal. Well, this is logarithmic, and this is more like a normal distribution, some sort of log normal distribution. Uh, interesting, the peak is about 1,000 minutes, which is about a day. Uh, so people take the time to initiate the conversation even. And then if you look at the response time, the first response to the first initiation, a uh, more or less similar distribution. The first peak is shorter. People do not respond right after they will receive the message. Again, they take their time, but also they do not wait that long. The whole distribution is a bit shifted to the left. So on average, it takes 2.4 days to, to send the first response, whereas on average it takes almost a week to initiate the conversation. Well, not on average, yeah, actually on average, yeah. Um, okay, uh, the conversation length in, num in terms of number of messages in a conversation follows this distribution. A majority of conversations are very short, up to 20 messages, let's say. Uh, well, there is a very long tail, but the tail really disappears when you reach about 100 messages. So these conversations are not that lengthy. And think about it, when you text your friend, within a few minutes you might already have sent uh, 20, 30 messages. So the nature of these conversations are quite different to usual text-based communication that we have on our normal life. Uh, if you look at the length of messages in terms of the, ca the characters and the words in them, they also more or less follow a log normal distribution. But there is a little peak here, uh, and that is because of all those highs or hello. Uh, this is the number of words per message, but the rest uh, follow log normal distribution. If you look at any other measure of length, like words per conversation, letters per conversation, they all follow more or less a log normal distribution. Well, you, you see normal distributions when central limit theorem works, right? When we have some random variables being added together. When we have a log normal distribution, some multiplicative random process is involved, which is just a multiplication of random numbers taken from the same distribution. Well, we could not go really further in terms of modeling uh, what is happening here, but it already gives us some hints on the underlying processes. And that's basically the more you talk, the more likely you carry on and then talk even further. It's kind of explosive multiplication uh, that is happening there. If you look at the length of conversation in minutes, uh, it's the distribution of it. It deviates from a log normal distribution, and it's kind of bounded between a, a day and a week. Uh, remember the conversations are not that long, typically 20, 30 messages, but they take rather long time. A, a day to a week for 20 messages is kind of a very low pace, almost four messages per day. And as I said, this shows that the nature of conversations here are different. People really take the time to to craft a message or to respond to a message sent by the other person. We knew the gender of users. Um, well, this is a kind of problematic picture, but I, I thought I could use it to make a point. 83% of conversations are initiated by male users and only 70% by female, and that's very interesting because the platform is a very modern idea, uh, and it's symmetric. Female and male users have the same uh, choices and same 
uh, options. But still, you see that uh, some cultural biases are reflected in this very modern platform. But still, lots of conversations are initiated by male user. More interesting, if the conversation is initiated by a female user, it's less likely to get a response. Again, some sort of cultural reflection. If you are the guy, you are supposed to initiate the conversation. And if the girl initiates the conversation, as a guy, you might feel, oh, maybe I should pass this one. I'm not suggesting you should do that, but this is what the data suggests. Um, actually, there is a very interesting paper uh, by the, my friends from Queen's University um, in London. Uh, they surveyed users. Uh, they did not have great data set. Uh, they asked female and male uh, how many likes they ha how many right swipes they have given up to a certain date, and you see that majority of females had very few likes, whereas guys, some of them had a very big number of likes. On the other side, if you ask them how many matches you have got so far, uh, females have received lots of matches, and guys do not receive that many matches. And then if you look at the literature, already in 2006, people have reported that male con males consider online dating more, of a, more as of a number game. You know, they just keep swiping right to see what happens, whereas females are more selective. Uh, they like not that many times, but when they do, they actually mean it. That also might explain the previous uh, observation about initiation and reciprocation. Uh, and when you think about this, uh, this is not a, a stable system because if females keep becoming more, more and more selective and guys imagine they swipe right 100% of times or close to 100%, it's, it's kind of destabilizing this whole system because it's kind of, there is some sort of reinforcement and it goes to the extreme. At some point, the whole system collapses because all the 100% of Pictures that female get to see, if they swipe right, it's going to be a match. And for guys, they have to swipe right all the time. So uh, these apps have to come up with some ideas uh, or some strategies to limit this behavior. But you can write down a simple equation to model this behavior. Well, I'm not going to go through this, but you can show that it doesn't, it diverges to the extreme. Okay, uh, let's look at the content a little bit. Uh, as I told you, we knew if there was a question mark or an explanation mark in the message. Uh, male uh, asked more questions. 40% uh, of messages sent by men has a have a question mark in them, but only 33% by women. Uh, explanation mark is just the opposite. Females use explanation mark way more often than males. Uh, and if you look at the ratio of the number of words sent, the number of uh, sentences and the number of messages per conversation, men always talk more on these uh, apps, uh, which was a little bit surprising to me. So these numbers are the ratios, female per male, and uh, they are always a smaller than half, meaning that there is a dominance in terms of talking for men, uh, at least on these apps. But then you might say, well, we know that men initiate the conversation. Maybe it's just because they initiate the conversation. It's not about the gender. So split the data set into conversations initiated by males and females. And we saw that actually, yeah, that some, some extent initiator has the dominance. If you look at the conversations that are uh, initiated by females, uh, some of these values get larger than half, but it's still not as big as the opposite. So it's a combination of gender and the fact that if you have initiated the conversation, that explains your dominance in the conversation. Okay, uh, well, that's very basic and uh, descriptive, of course, so far. Uh, we wanted to measure the success rate and come up with an idea if we could predict success in a conversation. But you had to define success, and we did not know what is going to happen after people talk, and then they might go on a date, etc., etc., and we were not interested in collecting that data. Uh, but we knew that if there is a phone number in a message, and we consider it as a proxy of success, because if people exchange phone number, they want to take it to the next step, which could be a phone conversation, and oftentimes, actually, it's a sign of uh, trying to set up a date, and you exchange the phone number just to make it easier to find each other. 90% of conversations have a one phone number in them. 70% of uh, conversations 
have phone numbers from both parties that I don't know why because if, if someone has the other person's phone number that should be enough uh, and among those that only have one person uh, one person has sent a phone number the majority or a bigger number a bigger percentage of them uh, is the female who has sent the number so the guy have asked for the number this shows when the phone number is sent uh, uh, in, in terms of the number or the message sequence number uh, and you see that the majority of uh, cases phone number is sent already before the 30th message so it's also very quick uh, if you think about it sorry how much time do I have okay that's very good so we could uh, so uh, as I said we wanted to predict if the phone number is going to be sent or not and you can we, we picked up a few different parameters uh, just very basic things, the number of words sent by each party, uh, the length of conversation, uh, number of question marks. Some of them give us some uh, good odds, uh, some of them are not that correlated. The most correlated parameter was messages sent by female over male. So if women talk more, they are more interested probably and it's a more balanced conversation and it's more likely that a phone number is being exchanged. Uh, the smallest odds ratio was when um, the initiator message ratio was considered. If the person who initiated the conversation keeps talking, it's not a good sign. Uh, there is not much of chance of a phone number exchange. And you can see there are some other factors involved here, like if there is a question mark, it's more likely that something good is gonna happen. More interesting, we had the social separation of the pairs on Facebook, and that was the most interesting data that we had actually. Um, and I'm sure you know what social separation means. So this is me in the center, my friends are at distance one from me, friends of their friend, my friend are at distance two, and then etc. etc. On Facebook, the average separation is, does anyone remember? Well, you have heard of six degrees of separation, and that's based on the offline board. And on Facebook, I think the uh, most current, most updated number is 3.5. So majority of us randomly chosen from the whole network are at a distance of three or four. So it's a very small world type of network. So we knew this separation between two pairs and we could look at, for example, the rate of reciprocation as a function of distance, social distance. Uh, well, people who are at distance one, um, they are not anyway uh, introduced to each other very often because the app doesn't want to do that. If you're Facebook friends, it doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to also meet at a dating app. But if you're introduced to each other, majority of cases you get a, if you initiate a conversation, you get a response. Uh, it's very unlikely that you exchange phone number. But for other distances, two, three, and four plus, uh, the, the, the larger the distance become, the less likely that the conversation gets reciprocated. Makes sense. But then if the conversation get, gets reciprocated, the chance of exchanging phone number is independent of the distance. And that's very interesting because the further you get on a network, it's less likely that you trust the person or you show interest in person by responding to their message. But if you have a started a mutual conversation, then some trust is built and then the chance of phone number being exchanged is independent of your distance. Um, okay, let's summarize. Well, this summary is, uh, meant to be for guys, sorry, uh, because guys are more desperate. Uh, first of all, dudes, initiate the conversation. It's a still your job. Uh, take your time, be patient. The person might not get back to you right after your message, but it's not necessarily a bad sign. Don't make a very long conversation. Ask for number rather early in your conversation. Let the other person talk. Don't keep just asking questions uh, without getting any answer. Uh, however, asking question is important. Only one percent of successful conversations did not have any questions in them. Uh, and then finally go for uh, friends of your friends, people who are at distance too in your social network. Thank you very much. Yeah, we just started to look at different models that 
could explain those distributions. We haven't done much, to be honest, yet, but I would be more than happy to have this conversation to see what you think. Uh, yeah, I think modeling would be the right next step. One is the zero incentive, so you've got a problem with the appointment of zero, so it's a problem with zero and the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, <clears throat> you mentioned the mechanism design problem for these types of apps. I mean, does your data give any suggestions for how we can do a better job of mechanism design? Yeah, a very simple uh, suggestion, which actually uh, later is intru was introduced by some apps, is that to limit the number of likes that each person could commit, because if it's infinitely large number, then the system goes to that uh, attractive uh, point that it's very uh, imbalanced. Uh, that's one thing. And then the other apps, for example, put some limits. Uh, you get disconnected if there are two, four, 24 hours passed and you did not initiate any conversation or you did not receive any message. So it puts some pressure on the users to kind of follow the success route of a successful conversation. Yeah? When you mentioned, like, again, this topic of the imbalance is created, uh, you said you can write down an equation to show the divergence to extremes, uh, but wouldn't that assume that everyone sees everyone, whereas in reality, different people, depending on the popularity, see different people? That, that is true, but we do not know how these apps work, and uh, they, the companies do not reveal uh, what algorithms they use, whether, this is one hypothesis, we are not sure that uh, popularity is what the app uh, considers when tries to introduce people. Well, I know, for example, on Tinder, it looks at your Facebook likes, what pages you have both like, and if there is commonality, then you are more likely to be introduced to each other. That is true. We did not include that in our, our, our model was a very simple mean field approximation of, uh, every, yeah, uh, kind of everyone could see everyone. There is an infinitely large pool of users. Oh, by the way, uh, before I forget, there is a preprint up there, and this is being under review, uh, if you are interested to have a closer look. Well, can we take a second to thank um, Dr. Yasneri?